Good morning. I think we'll go ahead uh, and get started at this point. Uh, I am Mary Margaret Deneen, uh, the Director of the Global Programs Division at ABA Rowley, and also the uh, Just Track Program Director. Um, and it is uh, my pleasure to welcome everyone uh, and also to introduce uh, Scott Carlson, uh, who is ABA Rowley's Senior Director for Programs and Strategic Initiatives, uh, who will be starting us off this morning. So over to you, Scott. Thanks, Mary Margaret. Well, good morning, everyone. I've been really excited about this day arriving. The Justice Sector Measurement Talks is, a, is something a little bit different for us. We're trying something a little different. Um, could you advance to the next slide? Perfect, thank you. So a few housekeeping items before uh, I plunge in and it'll give you a second to absorb this George Bernard Shaw quote. As you know, the event's being recorded um, and everyone's invited to introduce themselves in the chat box. I would also invite all of you to take a look at the bios of the moderators and presenters that are gonna be you know, organizing us and chatting with us over the next two days. We really have a very, uh, I think, diverse and interesting group of people lined up. And last but not least, um, this is a measurement discussion. So of course we need to measure this discussion. And so there will be a brief Mentimeter survey at the end of the session. And we really ask everyone to take a moment to fill that out because your feedback is critical. So to go back to the George Bernard Shaw quote, um, well, I'm an English major and undergrad, so any excuse to quote Shaw is a, is a fun thing. But I think this quote really captures some things about the challenges that we're facing and the importance of timing and repetition and measurement. You know, as we all know from working in this business, measuring something that's important just once is often not sufficient. But there are also questions of when you measure something um, and how often you do. And that can be very critical as we're going through a program life cycle. And we're thinking about that right now at ABA Rowley. As some of you may know, uh, we adopted the Dev Results uh, MEL platform for the entire organization over the last year. But now becomes the next part of the challenge is what do we do with this data? How do we use that? How do we time its collection and review? And so we're looking at how to implement that. And we don't have all the answers and we welcome everyone's thoughts on those things. Next slide. So um, if, if I had a dollar for every time I've heard the phrase complexity aware over the last couple of years, I'd probably be a much more wealthy man than I am at the moment. And I think it's not to make light of it complexity aware thinking is critical to rule of law programming and justice sector uh, reforms and enhancements. But as you can see, I, I, I'm picking on the OECD here a little bit because I actually quite like this model. And that's why I call this a, a bit of a provocation is because here they're describing, the OEC is describing the people-centered justice approach that OECD and Pathfinders have been spearheading, but it's also recently been adopted uh, and, and pushed forward even further in the last you know, few days with the UN report on their common agenda, where they also endorsed this. But I share this visual because it's obviously um, a very complicated uh, diagram, and there's a lot of elements to this, and in fact, I had to cut off a little bit at the bottom to make uh, the rest of it readable. But each of these points, as you can see, it's, it's framed in terms of like a program life cycle. <clears throat> each of these points is very important uh, for us as uh, rule of law professionals who are trying to implement programs to think about. Um, and first and foremost, I take away from this is that when you look at this and all of these variables and the in the program life cycle. It tells me that we should be having more gatherings like what we're having today. Um, and, and second, it tells me that we should be finding ways to do this um, in, 
in new ways so that we're actually working together with um, our donors, DRL, INL, and USAID who are joining us today to think about how MEL efforts can actually affect future designs and programs to address this complexity aware environment. Next slide. So Albert Einstein's uh, quote here, uh, I, I just found very apropos for the challenge ahead over the next two days. What we are doing is hard. Rule of law is not like public health with elaborate test methods of causality and et cetera. And as much of, uh, I, as a fan of data as I am, I would also like to challenge us to think about how we capture qualitative changes that have real impact to the users of justice services. Um, there's, there's a lot of things that we can count very well, some things not so well. But some of those things that aren't so easy to count are very important elements of rule of law and effective justice systems. So with those uh, uh, musings, I'm going to turn it over to Kate Kruger, who's a m and &E advisor, a male advisor at the U.S. Department of State's Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor. Um, please help me welcome Kate. It's over to you, Kate. Great. Thank you so much, Scott. Great introduction. Uh, my name is Kate Kruger, uh, as Scott said, and yes, I'm an evaluation advisor at the Department of State Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights and Labor. So I'm thrilled to be moderating today's panel on measurement and evaluation in judicial reform programs. Thank you for inviting me. So what excited me about this topic is if you can get measurement of rule of law right, it kind of opens the door to everything else in the DRG sector. Um, this topic is justice sector programming is sort of foundational to the rest of DRG space is what I'm trying to say. The formal and informal legal environments we operate in determine so much about what kind of civic life and expression is open to citizens and whether there's a like, institutionally conducive environment to implement good governance reforms or human rights safeguards. So this is really the key in a lot of ways. So as an evaluator, understanding how to measure the success of rule of law programs is a really exciting and challenging prospect that I look forward to learning more about from our panelists today. So as Scott mentioned in his introduction, uh, there are a lot of considerations and I would even say tensions in approaching how to create MEL systems that are both precise and useful and not onerous. So there's a ton to keep in mind. And to add a third quotation for the day, and unfortunately it's the third quotation of a man, so I think we need to start quoting women from this point on. Uh, there is a British statistic statistician, George Box, who once said, all models are wrong, but some are useful. So our you know, constant goal is getting towards that model of an m and &E system and even theories of change in the sector that are elegant enough to measure, um, but not over onerous and over the top or oversimplified. So rules, speaking of rules, each presenter or each presentation will be limited to 10 minutes followed by 15 minutes of discussion. So please note that I'll be politely calling you out once you get to your time and there'll also be someone giving you notations in the messages. Um, also during that discussion, when speakers are done, I will kick off a Q&A session. We'll have about 15 minutes for each Q&A. And if you'd like to ask a question of the speakers, which I strongly encourage you to do, please just use the raise hand function down at the bottom of your screen. You're probably all pretty familiar with Google Calls at this point, but it's shaped like a little hand and it should be at the bottom of your screen. You can also type something into the chat and I can read it out for you or call on you from there. Um, so I'll call on as many folks as we have time for in those 15 minute discussions and then we'll move on to the next speaker. So thank you so much for attending. And uh, let's get started with our first presentation from Dr. Pim Albers and Jay Tokol, who will be discussing the measurement of success in judicial reform initiatives. Thanks, folks. Thank you very much, uh, Kate, for uh, the introduction. And of course, our challenge to keep everything into the time standard of 10 minutes, which is not an easy task when we are talking about our practice notes that uh, Jay and I have developed over time <clears throat> as you can see on the bottom uh, on right hand side there is the link to uh, the just tech uh, knowledge portal where the uh, integral uh, report of the the practice note can be found the practice note itself is composed of um, five different elements the first element is focusing on the basic concept 
for measuring success and results. I will go into detail a little bit later. Approaches for measuring success in judicial reforms, but also it's important to take into consideration which kind of norms and standards uh, can be applied and should be applied when um, implementing judicial reform projects. Um, and also as a part of our practice note, we consider some elements which concerns the, the data quality, uh, reliability and integrity of data, what to do in data poor environments, for example. And the last part of the uh, practice note is related to uh, many annexes where examples are being provided uh, based on uh, one side, the uh, norms and standards for judicial reforms, and on the other side, uh, gives an overview of the methodologies and ways to measure uh, judicial reforms. Next slide, please. Uh, the basic concepts uh, for measuring success and results that are being presented at the beginning of the practice notes are focusing on what are the boundaries of the practice notes, what do we see as judicial reforms. Well, in a nutshell, it's mainly focused on uh, the functioning of courts and the entities that are influencing the work of courts. And that can include, for example, offices of the public prosecutor, but the police uh, as well, when it comes to the criminal justice system. Uh, we also <clears throat> go into detail uh, with regards the measurement, what is measurement, but also how we define success in terms of uh, achieving goals and objectives. And we highlight uh, some uh, elements of the uh, program development uh, cycle in a, a less colorful way that uh, Scott has been presented with the uh, OECD model. We have tried to keep it uh, more simple and to, to refer to the, uh, the basic uh, program cycle, explaining uh, you start with the environmental analysis to be followed by uh, the creation of uh, logic models, um, then to set uh, indicators, but also to think about uh, methods and evaluation approaches. And of course, then to, to start with measuring the interventions that you have defined as a part of a project or uh, a program. Next slide, please. Um, in all judicial reform uh, projects, one of the starting points are the norms and standards, uh, because they are the, the points of reference to define which kind of activities are necessary in developing countries in the sphere of, of courts and court organizations. So we have uh, listed a couple of these uh, standards in the practice notes. Uh, for example, in the sphere of independence of judiciary, it's always a nice and popular topic, how to strengthen the independence of judiciary or how to improve the independence of judiciary, what are the main elements of independence or, uh, for judiciary and what are the standards. Well, here we uh, define some uh, sub uh, factors, for example, um, when it comes to independence of judiciary, we focus on recruitment of judges how they are being recruited is there is some influence from the side of the executive or legislative uh, branch. We look at the way how judges are being evaluated, training and education, as well as the institutions that are representing the interest of the judiciary. For example, uh, councils for judiciary or uh, a Supreme Court that can be the focal point for the judiciary as a whole. The second standard that we um, listed in our practice note is related to effective and efficient courts, and that varies from uh, the use of time standards, uh, how the, the workloads among judges and courts are being uh, distributed, what are the problems in the sphere of the, 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 cur the courts in urbanized areas compared to rural areas, uh, the integrity and uh, maintenance of court records is another uh, important aspects in some courts you will find the court records in the in the corridors of uh, the courthouses or even in uh, stairways I have seen that with my own eyes and I can imagine that sometimes documents get lost information technology 
uh, and the standards are being used as well as uh, specialization, of course, and the use of active case management. Now, another example of norms and standards are concerning the promotion of accountability and transparency in courts. You see that in many uh, developing uh, programs that uh, courts should not only be independent, but they should also be accountable for the work and uh, the products that they are delivering. And uh, that can uh, vary from, let's say, the publication of, of annual reports by the course, but also the publication of uh, core performance data and so on, and the involvement of uh, civil society organizations that are uh, monitoring the work of courts. Now, the last example uh, is that uh, is uh, presented in the uh, practice note concerns access to justice, always a key. Uh, topic when it comes to judicial reform programs, and here we included uh, examples of women and justice and disability and justice. And now I have to quickly move on uh, the microphone to Jay that will highlight uh, the rest of the presentation. Thanks, Pim. Um, the third uh, section of the practice note focuses first on what one needs to consider in determining an appropriate approach to success measurement, as well as data collection methods that may be employed in each approach. Some of these key considerations you would, you would already know, like what aspects of the project are being measured, what kind of change is being measured, is it a policy, system, community perception change, or is it capacity of individuals among others? or how many and what approaches is the program using to affect change, because that introduces some complexities as to how you're gonna measure um, judicial reform initiatives. Um, what data collection methods are permissible and feasible and most especially applicable given uh, both programmatic context and resource constraints. So most judicial reform initiatives um, hit hit the a wall when um, data collection cannot be verified uh, data collected cannot be verified or validated at the court level and and um, there are methods that can be considered um, based on feasibility definitely so approaches we highlight in this practice notes are those that we also feature as examples for each normative area answering the question how have others measured success in these areas some of these approaches are listed on this slide we also include an extensive list of sources for each approach under our resource list. I'll move on to the next slide uh, in the interest of time. Um, last component, major component of the practice note concern, uh, is about measurement in judicial reform initiatives, uh, specifically on data quality. So um, quality data is very important. We have encountered um, a lot of programs where uh, data quality from the start uh, is the issue. And, we always, we always say that uh, Mel is trying to fix what the program itself is trying to resolve. So poor data management in courts, poor data management in justice offices are generally, you know, um, the lack of data um, uh, uh, in the country is uh, the common concern. So this uh, practice note component talks about um, how we can select um, data uh, data that we can use what are the data quality standards and what systems um, we ought to uh, to have in our uh, programs uh, to ensure data quality next slide please um, the final component um, which is an annex really a series of annexes um, pertain to results measurement examples for every normative area you will note that there are 12 annexes included uh, in the practice note. Um, and each of each of the uh, core topics that are identified in the normative um, areas, section two, will be uh, have have um, consequent examples that we have uh, listed under the practice note. Um, we have 12 annexes in total and more than 50 examples uh, provided. Um, some examples are actually um, highlighted in this slide, um, uh, John Gates, could you click? So one one example that we feature in the annex is public perceptions and evaluations, highlighting one on judicial independence in Serbia, um, which used before and after comparisons of stakeholders' um, perceptions, like 
court users, general public, and businesses. Um, it, I think um, assessed within a three-year time frame. Um, next, please. Another example is on regulatory administration and compliance evaluation, where beyond compliance to processes like judicial selection, evaluation may focus as well on testing results and performance reviews. Next, please. One other um, topic that is in these annexes is the Kirkpatrick model, which may be featured in the next uh, in one of the presentations um, in, in this uh, measurement talks. The Kirkpatrick model is used mostly for judicial training programs, um, measuring across four and in, in some um, uh, adjusted methods, five areas. Um, next, please. We also we are here. at time, Jay, if you can wrap up in the next 30 seconds or so. Sorry for cutting you off. No worries, Kate. Um, next one is on impact evaluation. It features one from the Philippines, which um, puts, uh, was put together by 3IE. It's a recent one. It highlights results of continuous trial implementation using longitudinal data. Next, next slide, please. And that's it. Um, this is how uh, this is where we wrap up, Pim. Would you like to have a sort of your closing <laughs> remarks? Well, uh, you have covered all what's included in the, the practice notes. I can only say have a look on the practice notes. It's uh, also developed in an interactive manner. So if you want uh, to select one of the topics that has been highlighted, you can just simply go to the Just Track uh, portal and uh, select what you want. And I hope that uh, the users of the, the, the portal and the knowledge uh, uh, product uh, will appreciate it. And these users can vary from, from donors, implementers, and people like Jay, uh, the, the monitoring, evaluation, and learning specialist. Thank you. Thank you, Pim. And I, I, we would be remiss if we do not acknowledge the community of practice that had contributed to uh, major, major components of this practice note. We have both justice sector specialists and MEL specialists in our lineup, and we appreciate them um, uh, as much as um, th this, uh, as, as so much. <laughs> and and we'd, we wouldn't wanna miss um, thanking them for, for all their inputs. Thank you both very much. And all things considered, you crammed a lot of information into a short little presentation. We, we really appreciate it. Um, my first reflection before I open it up for questions is just, this sounds like an incredible comprehend, incredibly comprehensive tool, but it's also outlining uh, evaluation approaches that require lots of different skills, you know, from something like process tracing and contribution analysis to outcome harvesting. There's all kinds of skills at play here. So I'm wondering uh, if you had to have practitioners focus on building one skill or practice into their m and &E systems that might be applicable across lots of these different approaches. Do you have kind of one parting shot piece of advice or thing you would like people to build based on the lessons learned from this tool? Well, it's a, not an easy question, I would say so, but uh, I would recommend, let's say that at least um, the persons that are involved in uh, developing a program or uh, start some basic ideas of, of measurement, that they dive into detail on, on methodologies of, of evaluations and, and practices. And uh, we have, uh, for that reason, uh, included many uh, reference material that is uh, well described and uh, easy to understand. But of course, um, I also need to add to that the um, evaluation as such is a specialism and uh, but it's important not to overlook when you are developing uh, a program so that i would say always needs to be included and uh, it only underlines the need for having uh, the right persons uh, in a project team or a program team that is responsible for either developing a monitoring evaluation and learning program or conducting an evaluation i would thank you for that pim i would add also you know um two things i guess um, one one key aspect of judicial reform um is on the institution and 
it's is on court performance mm -hmm. and, and um honing and incorporating those systems for um data quality in court systems is crucial for us to even measure um, baseline to end line results the other aspect um, i think substantively is the people-centered approach that scott uh, mentioned a while ago we're moving away from just institutions performing but also beneficiaries or stakeholders um stakeholders having a say or a stake into judicial performance indicate uh indicators that we use for judicial performance um third third aspect is budget i think one hindrance for any evaluation especially in this sector is low budget especially with um understanding of the complex um, contexts that we set these reforms in yeah it's easy to say you're going to measure something harder to do if you don't have the funds to do so um and i see a hand up from ubaid sadat uh please go ahead yeah, this is Obed Sadat from CLDP program. Uh, I had a question about this quick Patrick method. You know, I'm familiar with the uh, the first two parts, the action and learning is easy to measure, asking the participants uh, about their feeling, how they felt during their training and as well as being the pre post test for the knowledge gain or learning. So what's the best tool or method to measure the behavior change, you know, the behavior? You know, for, for the results, we can do the survey at the end of the year to ask the beneficiaries if they have received the services but is there any tool to measure the behavior i'll answer quickly um and thank you for that question we do have um, a presentation on kirkpatrick model and they would feature an example of how they've used um uh, possible tools but one example that i could could uh maybe provide is actually in the practice note there is a um, material uh, developed that features tools and examples of how they've analyzed data from it. Behavior mostly talk about um, institutional performance if we're training judges and prosecutors um, in our programs. That means our main data would be um, court performance statistics, age, um, age data, and you could use um, like a a whole list of courts uh, performance data that are available in the practice note and, and um, plug it in. There's no, I don't think there's like a defined or named tool for, for behavior because there's several um, indicators that can be considered for those kinds of measurements. Thank you. I don't think I see any other raised hands. Does anyone else want to jump in with uh, additional questions? Right. While you're contemplating, I have more, so that's fine. Uh, my next question is uh, just a little bit about how you decided what methods to include. I guess I want to use this opportunity to see if there's any other approaches or tools that were not featured in this toolkit, but that you want to encourage folks to you know, take a look at in the future as well. Pim, I'll jump in and respond to that quickly. So the examples that we feature are based on resources that are available, um, open and online. So um, these are resources that are already out there, um, featured in, in some report, some in some evaluation report or uh, final report of programs. So that's one qualifying factor. We did a, a huge um, review of what is open and available. The other aspect is that we went by normative area and we tried to ascribe um, possible methods where there were none. So um, based on experience and some consultations with other male experts and other justice sector experts, we have put together um, these lists. Definitely, we may have missed others and we welcome any more inputs that could that could, that could um, sort of um, grow our repository of examples because obviously we have lots to learn from each other here. Yeah, just to add to that, I think uh, which methodology to use for monitoring, evaluation and learning, I think the starting point can be, uh, let's say, the logic model that you have uh, created in, let's say, the program or the project where you have some in intended intervention you define some objectives and indicators and, and goals 
and based on that, and indeed what uh, Jay was indicating, probably it is already connected to certain standards that are out there. And if you go through the standards, you will find the resources of proven uh, methods of evaluation. But of course, there can be new ways uh, for measuring, let's say, the success of judicial reform that we haven't yet included in our uh, approach. And that's why also the uh, practice note itself is a kind of a lively document where in the future, new and innovative uh, methods for, for data collection, for example, or evaluation will be included as well. Great. Uh Speaking of logic models and program designs, at what point in the program life cycle were you intending folks to use this document? Uh, Jay is <laughs> hesitating, so I will jump in. I would suggest to do that as, as, as soon as possible. So in the, at the moment that you have uh, developed a, a logic model or um, are being in the process of development. Uh, I would say open the practice notes because in this logic model, you'll have the standards, you'll find some resources about the methodologies for, for measurement and so on. So I would suggest to do that as, as soon as possible. Uh, also to underline the importance of including in the, the, the program development uh, some activities that are related to monitoring evaluation and learning and not to say afterwards mm -hmm. when uh, activities are being implemented oh we forgot the evaluation part yeah. and uh, let's try now to recollect uh, the information that we should have had uh, for measuring the effectiveness or success in judicial reform so uh, my recommendation would be to start at the beginning uh, so that you're not too late and miss, for example, the conduct of a baseline study. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And some examples actually emphasize the need for iterative measurement um, for not only for accountability as we go, but also for learning as we go, um, especially in programs where there's a lot more flexibility to to actually utilize the data that we collect. So in some instances, of course, you know, there are some constraints or a lack of flexibility in terms of how we can move forward with um, adjustments or changes that programs might have to consider. Um, and in those cases, we measure, but the utilization is low. But in some instances, definitely, there's a lot more flexibility and it, iterative sort of designs would help in those. Great, thank you. I'm sure every evaluator on this call is nodding their head thinking about a time where you couldn't evaluate something because we didn't have the right baseline data. Uh, we have a question in the chat um, from Ilona. Uh, Ilona says, I'm curious if you've given thought to including political economy analysis among the tools. And I'll also pause, Ilona, if you want to elaborate at all, please feel free to come on mic and explain your question. Sure, um, good morning, everybody. You know, USAID um, has incorporated uh, and strongly encourages political economy analysis for sort of getting at the deeper issues. And, you know, there may be sensitivities acknowledging that around the approach. But I think if you want to look at sometimes why there are roadblocks, it's really important to go into that deeper level of analysis. So I'm just wondering if you have given thought to that. And if you are interested in resources, I can send that offline. Thank you, over. Thanks, Ilona, for that question. Um, some examples that we feature incorporated political economy analysis as part of their overall approach, but not, not in itself, you know, not just uh, PEA in itself could measure uh, success in judicial reform. So it was, um, I think there are about two that included political economy analysis as part of their overall approach. If I'm not mistaken, it includes um, PA and um, some outcome evaluation um, uh, as an example. Um, I hope that answers your question. We don't highlight PA per se in the methodologies, but it is highlighted in the examples as we look at um, outcomes or goals to be measured. Yeah, it is definitely there in the, the practice notes. We try to cover everything, uh, let's say. 
Uh, and of course, uh, one of the starting points for uh, the, the program cycle is the conduct of the political uh, economic uh, analysis. And, uh, and it's one of the, the, the important uh, aspects, especially when you are working in countries where the uh, political situation is not stable or that there is a change in political leadership and that can have a radical impact on the, the programs or the project that you are implementing and the objectives can be even counterproductive when a new political leadership has arrived. So, yeah, definitely. Great. Um, we are at time. So if anyone else has any last quick question, I do want to allow time for that. But if not, I'll wait, I'll wait. I don't see any hand raising. All right, thank you so much to you both for this presentation. This seems like just an incredibly useful and rich resource. I definitely look forward to uh, taking a look and playing around in it some myself. Uh, so let's pivot over to our next presentation. Um, this is going to be from Dan Hall, who's Vice President on Court Consulting Services at the National Center for State Courts. Dan will be speaking about applying the international court excellence standards. So I'll hand it over and thank you very much. Good morning from Denver, Colorado. I'm sure there are people all over the world here. So uh, I don't know if it's appropriate to say good morning, good afternoon or good evening. But anyway, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, next slide, please. Um, you know, what I'd like to briefly talk about is the international framework uh, for court excellence. Uh, in 2007, um, we formed a consortium with the members that you can see here uh, with the goal of developing a framework of values, concepts, and tools that courts worldwide could use to assess and improve the quality and administration of justice. PIM was part of this effort uh, back in 2008, 2009, and, um, and the international framework uh, was developed. It's now, you know, it started with four members. We now have over 50 members uh, from 20, 25 different countries. Uh, there's no funding for this organization. It is totally voluntary. And the whole mission of this is self-improvement. Uh, and um, so that's well, what I'm going to talk about. Next slide, please. And so the consortium developed the International Framework for Court Excellence. And it's very simple. There's really four uh, components to it, uh, two of which you see here. It starts with the court values uh, that, um, that uh, uh, we identified th through the Bangalore principles, through uh, the principles of, uh, that uh, uh, we have used in the United States through the trial court performance standards and others. And then those are linked to seven areas of court excellence. Um, and what you see there, I'm not going to read through them, but these values are then linked to court leadership and, and what you see before you, uh, uh, you know, of all those areas of excellence. Uh, we are now on the third edition. We just released the third edition of this, of the international framework. Uh, and, uh, and we've just, uh, as we've gone through experience, I personally have done, I think, uh, present, uh, evaluate these uh, self-assessments in between 15, 18 countries. Uh, and it's really primarily uh, used as a tool. So what you have here, are the, the, uh, the two of the four components, the other is a self-assessment instrument, which, is, uh, which has been developed. Uh, and uh, and along those those uh, those areas of um, of excellence, uh, we have crafted 84 criteria assessments uh, statements across those areas of excellence. 77 are general statements, and I'll give you some examples here in a minute. And those are what we had in the in the first two editions. And what we've added in this edition are seven more effectiveness statements. And those are intended to assess, you know, how the effectiveness of courts uh, having responded to those questions. So you'll see from these, st these statements, 
um, that they're 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 aimed at uh, this it's, uh, just self assessment, but then having a, say, a way of saying, that, have you been effective in doing those? At the bottom of this slide is the link to uh, the um, to the self assessment in instrument on the court uh, court excellence website. Next slide. What I'd like to give you now here are some examples of what are what uh, some of the criteria statements. Uh, so you can see in uh, court user engagement, you see those the number of uh, statements that are here. We regularly obtain feedback to core to understand our court users' demographics and their requirements. Um, and the other example below that on the use of technology. And so going through these self assessments and what uh, we have done is usually go through the court community. Uh, with judges and uh, attorneys and get their feedback on these types of responses. Next slide. And what you see here is examples from Singapore, how they, what they did in response to those uh, responses to their, to those self-evaluation qu uh, questions. And they, um, um, they really created an online case management system with the dispute resolution capabilities. Uh, they've launched the small claims tribunals in 2017. And so, you know, they've really taken action from those. And what tends to happen when we, the self-assessment instrument is used, we have to remember that uh, evaluation is a, is a marathon, not a sprint. And the self-assessment tool is a way for countries to really, or court systems to really get started on the journey to court excellence. And these tend to be helping move into planning and moving to formal evaluations uh, becomes very important to have performance measures. So once uh, um, courts have identified areas that they need improvement, part of that process becomes developing performance measures to evaluate those. And part of the, um, the framework are a set of global measures uh, that can be used. There's 10 global measures, uh, I think, that have been developed. Uh, the National Center, many of you know, have court tools, and they're very similar to court tools. And my experience uh, in the courts and doing this is that the trial court performance standards used to have 68 measures. And I tried to implement them all and couldn't. And so coming up with simplified measures uh, has, uh, uh, you know, a small set to, so, uh, so courts can, uh, can really learn to do evaluations become a, a very important component. Next slide. Here's another example of, uh, of uh, criteria statements in the area of strategic court management and in the area of court proceedings, uh, infrastructure and process innovation. And um, next slide. And in Singapore, these are examples of where, of uh, how, when they have done their, their assessment, the project, pro, the um, efforts that they have come out of that where they've uh, formed a business continuity planning and risk management. And so they have used, again, those, those criteria statements to come up. And, and what happens when you do these statements, as I've worked with them, um, is that out of all those statements, you'll have maybe uh, eight, five to eight that really come out. And working with courts, and working with the steering committees, having selecting which are those, these um, criteria statements, the results uh, are the most important. You're able to weed down and really hone in on priorities. Um, next slide. Here's another example uh, of some of the assessment criteria statements uh, along court user engagement. Uh, and uh, affordable and accessible court services. Next slide. So, and here's the example of how Singapore has responded with those. And I'm not going to read through this, but go to the last slide, please. 
You know, the other implementation of these sites, uh, our USAID project in Bangladesh really utilized the international framework as a way to engage uh, that project in the planning process. It's been used uh, in Dubai, Moldova, Indonesia, uh, and cl close to 20 countries. These are only, these are only uh, four that have used it so f that I've listed here. But uh, it's been widely used. Uh, other activities, you know, we've held re regional workshops uh, in Singapore and Australia, the United States and Washington, D.C., uh, New Zealand, uh, Dubai in uh, 2019, 2018, where uh, countries in that region uh, attended. The, and we're currently looking at holding another workshop in Singapore in March of 2022. Um, other developments, we've worked with uh, the United Nations Development Program in Asia to incorporate a judicial in integrity self-assessment module into the, into the international framework. So we look at really the, the integrity of the judiciary. How do you really get at corruption and assessing corruption? Um, let me finally just end by saying that, uh, reiterating that uh, um, pro that evaluation in courts or courts becoming excellence is a, is a marathon, not a sprint. And we've learned that the self-assessment tool often moves courts into an area of, of looking into a broader kind of efforts to for self-improvements and you can't you know the the some courts try to say well we've done the self-improvement and then we've conducted it two years later and look how much we've improved the self-assessment instrument isn't really an independent kind of measurement system and you have to go beyond into that into other global measures into other areas of uh, of excellence and so i hope uh, i've been able to uh, to uh, explain a little bit about the um, uh, the international framework for court excellence and and how it's been used. Great, Dan. Thank you so much. That was a really fascinating unpacking of the self assessment tool. My uh, opening question for you uh, is: What do you see as the strengths and weaknesses of self-assessment models of measurement. So to, to put an example on that, if you and you know uh, attorneys and other experts are reviewing a self-assessment and the expert in question says, oh, no way, this is not an accurate portrayal. This is not them you know, demonstrating their actual capacities and strengths and weaknesses. What do you do next? You know, I think what happens is the self-assessment instrument is a way for court leaders to kind of say, where is it that we need to concentrate, become excellent courts? Um, and I, th I th and because it is a, sur a survey, it's important that it be broad-based, that you have a lot of people give, providing input. And because there will be a variety of opinions, and it's all, it really is opinions, and you have to move beyond that. But it gives many courts an area where, this, for the first time, they've tried to use some kind of process in which to identify areas where they can, where they, uh, th where they can really start moving towards uh, improving their judiciaries. Great, thank you. Uh, I see a hand up from uh, Dr. Albers. Thank you, uh, Kate. Well, I have also experience with the implementation and the development of the, the, the framework. One of the initial ideas, and I would like to raise the question about this, was to use this, this scoring mechanism for the seven areas of excellence and the, uh, the weighting between the criteria. I know that we have had endless debates about it in the working groups um, and maybe to, to uh, develop some kind of comparative mechanism where uh, courts can rank themselves, who is the excellent court and who is a lesser excellent court. Um, what is your experience about this uh, rating mechanism? Is it actually applied? I did not, by the way. I just uh, used the, the self-assessment surveys more in a dialogue with uh, the participating courts. And what I noticed is that also the, the terminology that is being used in the framework is not always the language that the courts understand 
or management language. How did you dealt with it? You know, I think uh, the first uh, area we, I think now we didn't have time to go into the scoring mechanisms, but they be the scoring of the um, of, of the uh, criteria has gotten a little has gotten more sophisticated. Uh, and uh, so that the ratings, uh, you know, really there's more rigor. And on the website now, there's there's templates to help courts take it and do it. I think your point is very right, uh, Pim, in terms of some questions on this don't apply uh, to to certain courts, or they just don't understand them. Uh, and we've had to um, adjust those. In terms of comparing courts, there's been. The, the self, my view, the self-assessment questionnaire is not a proper way uh, to compare courts. This it's about self-improvement, and the scoring mechanisms uh, that even though they may come up, they're still based on self-improvement. And if you're going to compare courts against each other, you have to move into more, uh, uh, more uh, uh, independent measures measurements. Uh, and uh, but you know it's been a debate within the consortium about the role of the consortium. Is it to compare courts, or is it for self improvements? And at this point, we've taken the path of self improvement, and so avoiding because there's other organizations out there that are comparing courts, and courts get very suspicious of that. And we hope to provide courts a tool in which they can say, "Hey, let me let me learn to walk before I run." Comparisons based on self-assessments would seem like it would present some pretty perverse incentives for how that self-assessment. Right. Works. You say, aren't I good? Aren't I, aren't I so good? <laughs> um, very good point. Very good point. Uh, and Daniel Chen has a hand raised. Daniel, please. Hi. Uh, yeah, calling in from Tijori at the World Bank. Um, I was wondering if you could expand on the last slide um, as you were mentioning corruption as a topic you were studying, uh, perhaps in connection with Singapore. Um, is this the self-assessment module that you were just unpacking? Here it's, yeah, if you go on the website, there is. it's not about Singapore. We worked with UNDP and uh, with uh, the Southeast Asian countries and Thailand, Cambodia, uh, uh, Vietnam, uh, and, and uh, to develop a module around judicial integrity. And so uh, people are asking themselves, it, do I think I'm corrupt? Well, actually, no. You I mean there? It's a little more, uh, uh, not devious, but a little. It's not as direct as that. But there's a whole series of questions about education and judicial ethics, and and uh, uh, and uh, so area. So questions around the area of, you know, how do you maintain uh, judicial integrity within a court system? And if you go on our website, I think you can find that uh, that module. And it's not incorporated into the scoring mechanism. And this we did in Thailand. Uh, we did in incorporate it in when they did the assessment. But in 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 the uh, international framework itself, it stands as a separate module. Thanks, good question. Uh, Scott, do you want to jump on to elaborate on your comment in the chat? Sure. <clears throat> you know, one thing uh, that I've, I've seen when the IFCE standards were applied is that it can generate internal political will within the judicial institution. It can also then be uh, contagious in other government institutions mm -hmm. that might have funding decisions to make with regard to what the judiciary needs. And so um, while I acknowledge, of course, the limits of self-reporting as they've been described before, I think sometimes, um, you know, the old adage of what gets measured gets done uh, can apply in a situation like this even more potently if the, the counterpart that you're working with is invested in that measurement. And I think that's something we're just considering and thinking about. Thanks. That's a really good point, Scott. And I think that's our my experience having done it in Sri Lanka and, and Bangladesh and and uh, Bhutan. And I mean, it creates a, a political momentum. Great. We're at the two minute mark. Um, one question I have um, while we're waiting on any other folks is 
who, and forgive me if you mentioned this, uh, it's a little bit granular, but who is actually filling out the self-assessment? Is it multiple people from the judicial system? Are they more junior? Are they more senior? Uh, can you just talk a little bit more about that process of how you decide who fills it out or how it is decided, whether you decide it or not? Well, it's it's recommended that all levels of judicial personnel fill it out. Uh, and also, uh, we have often tried to get attorneys and people outside judicial partners to fill it out. Uh, typically, what, what we have done, though, is the as we've uh, conducted these assessments, we work with the uh, uh, a steering committee made up of court of the um, you know court leaders to decide where they want to uh, uh, issue it because uh, I mean it can uh, it can have some uh, political implications if you want to bring in prosecutors or other kinds of things. Great, not easy to do. <laughs> it's a very cool effort. Uh, any final questions before we move on to the last presentation? Okay, great. Oh, Jay. Jay's got a hand raised at the last minute. The, we've got an 11th hour question. I just needed to put it in there. Um, are there experiences uh, uh, in which countries or in what experience um, was the self-assessment not successful mm -hmm. as a tool? You know, are there contexts um, where it's not going to be useful um, in your experience? Um, you know, we've... Um, Indonesia have, took on a major effort for all the courts to cut for many, many of their courts to do this. And uh, their self-assessment became a race uh, to, to rate themselves very well. And um, we've had conversations within the consortium to say, to what area do we let courts join the consortium when they do those kinds of things? You know, we have no way to enforce any of this um, other than, you know, say, I mean, have you done it properly? And we've given feedback to some of those courts saying, yeah, uh, you know, th this isn't about us. This is about you and, and your own self-improvement. So I think, Jay, you make a very good point, And we've seen that happen. Uh, and it happens, um, you know, uh, sometimes also when courts do it uh, multiple times, they can't help but fall into a pattern. So, I mean, the the, the uses of the self-assessment instrument do, uh, are, I mean, there they, they, they are some very good positive areas, but, you, uh, you know, there are some limitations too. Great. Thank you so much. And uh, now, for those of you who had questions about the Kirkpatrick model, your time has come. Um, let's listen to uh, Malena Sanchez de Boado, who is a justice advisor at the US Department of State Bureau of International Narcotics and Law Enforcement. And uh, Stephanie Villaronga, um, ABA Rollies Columbia Program Director, discuss the Kirkpatrick model as used in Columbia judicial education programming. Take it away, thanks. Hi. Hello, everyone. I'm sorry I'm joining only by phone. We've been trying to get the camera to work for the last hour, but it's not working. Um, I promise you're not missing much. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of background of why we came to this project and Kirkpatrick, and then Stephanie will fill in the details on those things. But, but really, when I came to Columbia, I was the first justice advisor. I began the program we knew we wanted to work more with the judiciary because INL had traditionally not engaged with the judiciary directly, and we knew that that was the deficit of ours. So what we did was start out by doing an overall assessment of the judiciary led by myself and Virginia Covington and the FJC, um, a federal judge out of Miami who had worked a long time in, in Columbia um, and complemented by the Federal Judicial Center with their expertise, not only in judicial education, but also in court measurement and these types of things. I think I saw Beth on the line. Hi, Beth. Um, once we, we did that overall assessment, it was clear that the judicial school and judicial education needed to be addressed. And so we focused even more on that on the only judicial school, which is in Columbia, 
And what we wanted to do was more institutional reform sort of along the traditional lines of the World Bank and not just education itself, not just the courses themselves. So in some sense, the courses were a byproduct, but really it was about the sustainability of changing how the judicial school went about its business. And that included everything from, you know, uh, performance-based budgeting, how are they budgeting, um, who are they training, why are they training them in those subjects. And it was really key to do this with FJC because they had gone through a similar exercise for its own institution. And of course, the Colombians really appreciated the judiciary to judiciary collaboration. Um, when we started this project, we quickly realized that there weren't even learning objectives with the judicial school, much less any kind of consistent measurements. Um, it wasn't clear why courses were chosen or who was going to this, those courses. Um, some were excellent and got excellent feedback, but all of that was anecdotal. Others were much less so. So it's really when we, we knew that m and &E had to be a big component of this project, and that's where Kirkpatrick came in. Um, I would say in, in INL Bogota, our leadership is very, very focused on impact and m and &E. Um, thanks in part to the great work in, in WHP, and I think this project reflects that. It also meant, though, because we were doing this institutional reform, that it would take longer than just training. And it's why I mentioned that training is kind of a byproduct. Obviously, those courses are in and, in and of themselves important, but the idea was to build capacity enough measured in part by Kirkpatrick so that th we wouldn't have to stay there um, indefinitely, right? We would really focus on our own interests in particular courses as we will likely do in a phase two. Um, I do think that there is training fatigue across both the countries and the donor community. It's something that's questioned a lot. Why are we doing more training? Is that necessary? I'll just say that we're very aware that training is just one piece of a puzzle, but it is an important piece. Um, I always use the anecdote, you know, you can have a Harvard trained physician in the middle of the jungle, but if they don't have their tools, they can't do much, right, or their medication. But it doesn't mean that education isn't key. And so right now we're in the process of measuring the impact, which Stephanie will get into detail, but also seeing this training um, and our assistance to the training school as part of a comprehensive approach to the work that we want to do with the judiciary. So unless you have any questions, I'll just pass over to, to ABA and Stephanie. Thank you, Melina, and thank you all for being here today. Um, so in the short time that we have, I plan to provide just a brief overview of the Kirkpatrick model evaluation and it's um, and how ABA is currently applying it to our judicial training program in Colombia. And as Melinda mentioned, our program is part of a, a larger collaborative initiative with the Rodrigo Lara Bonilla Judicial Training School in Bogota to improve the delivery of judicial education in Colombia through a holistic approach of interventions that are focused on strategic planning, staffing, budgeting, and here um, with respect to the um, the educational courses offered at the school, how to improve the design and impact of those courses offered at the school. And so in this slide, I don't know if you go to next slide. Um, our, just briefly, our, uh, under our, the second goal of our program, ABA Rowley has spearheaded a design of a model curricula building on the judicial school's pedagogical framework for course design to include learning objectives and competencies pertinent to particular areas of criminal law for this INL program, with the intention that the school would be able to integrate and apply the design of the model curricula to all courses offered at the school. And under this model curricula design, we have integrated the Kirkpatrick model evaluation, um, which brings us to our next slide, please. And the Kirkpatrick model includes a set of tools that are used to analyze and evaluate the results of training and educational programs. 
It takes into account any style of training, both formal and informal, to determine aptitude based on four levels of criteria, five in certain modified versions, but I will discuss the primary four levels um, that we're applying to our, our, our program. And the use of the pyramid is, as the graphic is a helpful visual to guide us over the next couple of minutes as I describe each level, given that each level is a building block and is foundational for achieving the institutional impact to be sought. So broadly, level one measures the response by the participants to the training or educational course. Here, we can and have evaluated how engaged are the participants? How are they contributing to the the, the training or educational course, and whether the participants have enjoyed the training or educational course. Level one is very much focused on evaluating the reaction of the participant and to determine or understand the level of satisfaction with the content, the delivery, and whether the participant considers the training useful. Level two measures the learning experience of the participant during the implementation of the training or educational course in three areas, knowledge, increase, skills, strengthening, and an improvement in attitudes and values. Level two evaluation can also provide an opportunity for implementing partners and donors to identify where participants may need help, whether it's structural, for example, existing institutional impediments, or whether there are learning gaps to be bridged in the training or educational courses. It's important to note that at this level, we also begin to evaluate the critical behaviors of the participants. So while we have four levels, I'd like to briefly stop here and move to our next slide, please, to provide some context to how we are currently integrating the evaluation tools to measure levels one and two of our program participants. So our participants are judges, and to support the Colombian judiciary in improving its adjudication of particular criminal cases, the current focus of our program is on money laundering, corruption, and narco-trafficking. We're employing three evaluation tools to measure the reaction and learning experience of the judges. As you can see from the graphic model, we're primarily using one, pre and post questionnaires provided to the judges, two, observations conducted by our technical staff and experts instructing on the content, and three, pulse checks during the implementation of the educational course, for example, to gauge whether the learning environment is sufficient to facilitate their learning experience, and we've included questions tailored to have the judges apply the content learned in real time. So as I mentioned, the evaluation of the training and educational course is a process, and the first two levels are the foundational steps that can enable us to measure the performance of the participants, in our case, our Colombian judges, and then measure the impact or effect of their work on the larger institutional goals. I'd like to return to the previous slide, please. And before briefly describing levels three and four, it's important to measure it to mention that both these levels require a longer term investment on evaluation in terms of commitment from the relevant institutions, technical expertise, including an impact and evaluation and judicial reform, and a planned approach to evaluating the performance and impact on the institution. Currently within our program, we are finalizing our level three evaluation tools to measure performance of the judges who participated in the educational courses. And we are considering using questionnaires and interviews. Um, but here at level three, quickly, we plan to measure whether there are any changes to the performance of their work. So for example, how are they adjudicating cases? How are they conducting their hearings? Essentially, how have they incorporated what they've learned in a sustainable way? And level four, impact, the improvement at the institutional level. Here, we'd like to evaluate whether and how the training educational program has affected the larger institutional changes to be sought. Um, so um, here briefly, we um, the challenge here is identifying the final results and benefits at level four that are most closely linked to the, tr uh, our, the training program and to come up with an effective way to measure them in the long term. And um, and working with our, our partners um, here at the school and um, and with our donor, um, we um, are what we'll be focusing in on at that level four will be to um, seek and enhance the delivery of ju judicial education and improve the adjudication of cases. And with that, I think I'm at time. 
You are, unfortunately, but thank you so much for sharing um, both Stephanie and Milena. I really appreciated the presentation. Um, what I love about the Kirkpatrick model is that each step in that pyramid and your graphic sort of helps address a gap in the logic of how these information-based interventions are supposed to work. Specifically, it helps test those assumed connections between acquiring new knowledge and actual project outcomes, which I think is so important. Um, but before I monopolize your time with questions, I saw that we had a hand raised, but now it may have gone down. Oh, uh, I, I see someone. Please jump in. Um, I'm not seeing the name of. Yes, the hi. Jump in. Um, hi, this is Chantal Agarwal. Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, I have a question about um, the. Is there an um, an cost implication to conducting level three and level four? Mm -hmm. So, for example, as a very practical. Um, just I'm thinking about the implementation. So I, you know, obviously levels one and two, I would imagine are taking place during and perhaps after the training, but then to do that follow-up, does that require an extra budget implication? Thank you. Um, yes, it does, because it requires um, a more longer term engagement with following up on the participants. And so will require more time, as well as individuals who have the experience of conducting and helping to put together the, the evaluation tools that will be used in those level three and four assessments. Hey, Chantal, Jim, let me just add, though, this is a little bit why I said what I said in the beginning, which is we are very clear that we have to measure impact and really understand um, what are the benefits of our programming? So I would say throughout everything that we're doing in INL Bogota on, on justice sector reform more broadly, we do invest in m and &E. I don't think we have a single project that hasn't done this. And I know we're talking about Kirkpatrick, but there, we have another example on environmental rights and environmental crimes where we worked with a local university and actually started analyzing the different cases um, of environmental crimes and what the delays were, whether the laws were being applied correctly, um, et cetera, by a group of, of local experts, including judges. And I think the next phase of, of the ABA project will build on those efforts as well. But the short answer is yes, you have to be ready to pay for this. <laughs> Great, thank you so much, Milena. Uh, Amy jumped on chat and said, thanks so much for the presentation. Could you speak a little more about how you collected the baseline data for levels three and four? And also what methodology are you planning to use to collect level three behavior change data? Sure, thank you for that question, Amy. Um, so at, at this point in time, we are currently developing our, our level three evaluation tools and our baseline data will be the information that we collected at levels one and two because we will be in order the behaviors that we will be assessing or following will be the very judges that participated in the courses. So through levels one and two, we had conducted those pulse checks, um, pre and post questionnaires and had already collected information from the, the, the judge participants. We'd also conducted focus groups early on um, before um, implementing each of our uh, educational courses. And so that will be information collected from those um, different areas will be used as a baseline to inform how we develop the evaluation tools for level three to be able to get a better understanding of how of, of the performance of the judge participants. Great, good question. We've got Jay with a hand up. I just wanted to add to the responses and maybe outside the Colombia example of how behavior behavioral um, indicators can be assessed. So there's one where we can assess perceptions, right? We ask those that are trained, judges that are trained, how well do they know these topics? How well they have uh, used um, skills that are going to um, to they they will be trained on. So one is perception. You know the the thing about behavior is your analysis is as good as the information that your trainees are, are willing to provide to you. Because when we're talking performance here, no one wants to say that they're not performing well, right? <laughs> so at the level of knowledge and skills, 
we can be very um, judicious and ask them uh, what their perceptions are about their level of knowledge and skills in the area. The other aspect, and this is wholly reliant on the relationships that we we build with our counterparts, is the court court statistical information, which reflects the, if if your if your trainees are judges. Um, uh, this reflects largely on how the judges are performing. So if programs at the start have this clearly communicated um, and supervisors are on board in the measurement, behavioral assessment could mean assessing um, baseline indicators uh, based on court performance and endline indicators based on court performance with along with perceptions and conversations with supervisors or administrators. And I'd just like to add to Jay's comment that that's where level four becomes important because at level three, the, the participants are informing on their own um, application of how their behaviors have changed and that's a self more reflective of their own observations. But at, at the level four, what you're able to then see is complement that their, their own assessments with the um, I'll, I'll call it the outside observations of the impact on the institution, how you can collect that and how others are seeing the impact of the work that they're, that um, those participants in our case judges are performing. Yes, and to answer one more question uh, that was asked, yes, definitely it will require a lot of budget because you're not only budgeting for the data collection in the past, right, the pre and post test, you're also budgeting for the analysis that is required to triangulate or you um, collaborate all this information that's been collected throughout the years. So it's not it's not a one time funding mail thing. It's an evaluation separate fund that you'll have to um, to have uh, resources for. Stephanie, did you do uh, strictly like perception and reactions tests at level one and two, or did you also do like skills tests, like actual kind of tests that weren't just perceptions or reactions? We we did skills tests as well through those the pulse checks um, that we uh, through uh, I think two things I would say the pulse checks that we included in our our trainings, and I and I believe also through. In our in our the model that we design in each of our synchronous um, courses, we included interactive hypotheticals with um, with our participants. So we had an opportunity to give them and not to to observe and give them an opportunity to apply that knowledge and see how um, that knowledge and, and 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 be able to observe how the, their skills development and applying the knowledge to the context of the of, of the case at hand. Did you run into any resistance from folks to take skills tests? I know that this is a really common problem for implementers is they want to do pre and post tests, but people don't want to take them. Um, did you run into that? And if so, how did you address it? Well, we didn't do skills tests in, sure. in, in, that, in that sense. Um, we did more how observing how they applied the, the knowledge and the learning experience to the hypothetical situations. Um, and I, I have to say, I, I don't believe that we've um, experienced any resistance to that. Our feedback so far from the judges um, have been positive. But again, like just to be clear, we're in, in our courses, we're not giving them tests. We're not applying tests so that they can apply their or their skills. We're doing these hypothetical scenarios where they're working together and we're, um, we're seeing how they're applying the knowledge learned. I imagine that more nuanced, kind of like less punitive seeming design probably has something to do with why people are willing to participate. That's a really smart approach. Sorry about my cat in my face. Um, <laughs> does anyone else have um, questions? I, on let, me, let me just compliment by that. This, this project overall took a tremendous amount of relationship building in part because it got to some of their more fundamental questions about who is being trained, on what, what budget they're looking at, what their staffing is. So even to get to the point where you can create courses for them to evaluate, took a lot of, a lot of relationship building on first INL side and then ABA side. So that's a bit of a kind of warning to everyone or an experience I'm sure that's shared by many. That's an important warning and important consideration.
Uh, other questions? Okay, well, great. Uh, thank you so much um, to Stephanie and Milena and to all the other speakers today. Uh, this was really wonderful, and I think it just scratched the surface of what there is to learn about this topic. Um, so I will wrap it up here and hand it off for um, final remarks. Thank you, Kate. Um, so I'd just like to echo Kate's thanks to all of the speakers today for their stimulating pres presentations. They're really fantastic and interesting, and I think just the start of a conversation. I um, also want to thank Kate for her excellent moderation, keeping us on time, and um, uh, uh, posing interesting questions for uh, discussion and, and consideration. So thank, thank you all. Um, before we close, I just wanted to offer a few quick observations of, of some of the themes that um, came through for me from the from the discussions today. Um, first, I thought it was um, interesting how all the speakers um, kind of highlighted um, how uh, you know, the challenges of bridging the inherent complexity of measurement in this field um, with the resources. Um, and capacity that, that we have um, available to us. And, um, you know, I, de I definitely heard the interest in, you know, finding pathways to, to make that possible. So I, I hope um, we can continue that discussion um, in, in the next um, session. Um, some of the speakers offered observations of some approaches, consolidating standards and sort of lean tools um, to help us um, bridge, but um, certainly an area where, um, our community hopefully can can uh, identify some other steps um, through through this collaboration. Um, a second interesting um, theme I noticed um, was all the speakers um, were highlighting the many roles um, that exist for stakeholders and beneficiaries in measurement and um, you know, um, noting some of the considerations around that and how we um, you know, how we uh, collaborate with those different participants in the process and um, make sure that that, um, you know, the contributions are effective, um, potential other um, benefits of their engagement. Um, I think uh, Scott noted the, um, you know, the, the building the internal political will and, and having that um, be a basis for um, getting support of institutions who may not be involved in measurement. That was really interesting and um, also merits for their um, discussion and review. So um, I hope um, everyone will um, sign up for the Knowledge Portal. If you're not, not already a member, um, it does offer a place where we can talk about these um, topics in um, more depth and um, would love to see um, all of you taking part in those discussions. Um, before we conclude today's session, uh, I ask that you please help us by taking a few moments to respond to uh, a survey we've prepared. Um, we very much appreciate your feedback and suggestions on today's session. We really want to make these programs as responsive of, as possible to your needs. So please um, uh, click on the link. It's a Mentimeter survey. It'll just take a few minutes, I promise. And, and we'd be quite grateful for your, um, for your time and feedback. Otherwise, um, we hope to see most of you, if not all of you, tomorrow for what promises to be a fascinating session on the use of data. Um, to improve justice sector reform work. So with that, thank you.